you could sit right there. Hi, this is Meg Riley in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and you've joined us for another episode of The View. We'll introduce our special guests in just a minute, but first, I'll say that uh, Christina Rivera and Aisha Hauser can't be here today, but I am joined by my stalwart co-host, Michael Tino. Michael, how are you today? Good morning, Meg. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York, and um, I'm just fine this morning. Thank you for asking. Um, and as usual, we have on the tech deck, Jessica Star Rockers in the Pacific Northwest. How are you, Jessica? I'm doing good this morning. It looks like the sun might actually come up here for the first time in a couple of weeks. So I'm excited about that. Um, I am Jessica Star Rockers and I am on um, Twitter, hashtag the view. I am fielding your questions and comments on the Facebook live chat and passing those on to our hosts and our lovely guests. And um, yes, I'm thrilled to be here. Well, let's see, before we introduce our guests, I just wanted to flag that uh, Michael Slager, the officer who shot Walter Scott down in South Carolina was sentenced to 20 years in jail. You'll remember that one because there's so many they're hard to keep straight was the guy literally running away, getting shot in the back and then being accused of having a weapon. We are so grateful for people with cameras or we would non-officers with cameras, or we would never get any straight story on these. But, you know, I thought that was um, encouraging and a little different that he actually was found guilty and held accountable. If he hadn't been, well, so many haven't been. Michael, anything going on where you are? Um, not particularly here in, in New York, um, though, uh, you know, just on that particular note, so many things that are caught on camera still don't result in convictions because of the white supremacy baked into our <laughs> into our justice system so just that note um on the on the smaller world note um given that asia is not here i think it's appropriate uh for uh us to note that the uua nominating committee has has released its slate of candidates um for board and nominating committee and commission on appraisal and commission on social witness and um I know that maybe some of us in the room here are biased, but uh, I was very excited to see um, a, an interesting and diverse slate of candidates uh, being put forward, as usual, from the nominating committee. I mean, the, our nominating committee does great work, and Asia sits on the nominating committee. That's why I, I referenced uh, her not being here, um, but it was just exciting. And, and, and Jessica, uh, I, I was happy to see your name on that list, too. So. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be on it. Jessica, why don't you share what you were on the slate for? I am on for the Committee on Social Witness. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to be on that committee and, or be nominated for it, I should say. Um, and I also noticed some of the comments about um, in, interesting names that people were reacting to the many interesting sounding names on the slate this year, um, which I thought was um, great. I'm all for interesting names. Yeah, two, two of the CLF Learning Fellows, Jessica and also Rodney Lemery is, um, is nominated for, I don't know, Commission on Appraisal maybe. So I was very happy to see two present and Amanda Witherspoon, Witherspoon a former Learning Fellow also nominated. So hey, CLF Learning Fellows rock. <laughs> That some of us, as Michael said, are a little biased. Uh, yeah, so yeah, delighted. And Leslie Mack, who's a CLF member, is um, nominated. So yeah, lots of lots of good connections going on. Well, today we're having some guests back who we have had before. I'm trying to remember how long ago it was. Maybe 18 months. Maybe you remember. Maybe you don't. But we but we have Latifa and Colin Woodhouse, who are coming to us from Long Island but who um, are here to share their global humanitarian work. They've been devoted for some years now to the refugee crisis, which of course we're facing here in the United States, but which is taking a lot of different dimensions all over the world. Welcome Latifa and Colin. Yes, again, it's a pleasure to see you all and to talk to you about the work that we are doing and continue to do as we're all needed for helping the refugees 
Um, we actually went back to um, Lesbos in Athens uh, in March and April of uh, 2018. And um, we have now, um, and that was our assessment trip to see because the refugee crisis has taken a whole different shape now, these um, refugees, which is coming by the thousands um, every month are still coming, but the, the crisis has taken a different path in terms of how they deal with this. As you all know, the EU has closed its doors since 2000, March, 2016. So therefore, uh, the, Greece itself is uh, flooded in, in, in has about 75,000 refugees just alone in Greece. And um, also- Refugees from where primarily, Latifa? Where, where are the primarily refugees Primarily from? from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, um, Kurds, a lot of Kurds, and uh, now from everywhere else because of the environmental issues, Africa, you know, mostly from Africa also because of what's happening, economic um, situation, and also seeking a better environment in more water and uh, what's happening um, globally. And uh, that is what making them, you know, to, to leave their places and take their lives on their hands and uh, either die or reach somewhere where you could be safe and have a life in normal um, sea and, and safety. So before Maybe, you know, to... if I, uh -huh. I may say, you know, this is our second time and unfortunately you may call us back four or five more times because this is a, it's not a, it's a crisis, but it's a, a movement of uh, people around the world that won't cease. And that's what's striking about this, that it's a crisis that continues and, and it wears people down. It wears um, countries down. It wears uh, local people down. So uh, we as, a, a, as human beings have yet to address the causes of the, the push, uh, why people are being pushed out. And, or, and there, we went to see uh, UNICEF and we had a uh, meeting with the head of UNICEF in, in Greece. And he said, there's push and pull factors. And uh, that this kind of movement of people has been occurring since human beings uh, walked the earth. Uh, right now, it is the worst crisis since World War II and has surpassed World War II and the amount of refugees uh, and dislocated people, uh, forcibly di displaced people, we say, in the world. Uh, 65 million and it's growing. And of well, those let's 65... Let's talk about some of the root causes, yeah. Colin. Why, why don't you unpack some of the root causes for the exponential yeah. growth? You know, I, I'll, I'll do it using some of the stories that are people that we've met. And also statistically, there's there's a lot of information. But you know, we're we certainly there are people fleeing war, violence, uh, murder, uh, extortion, uh, and and those kind of folks. They're coming out of so many different countries. The initially uh, out of Syria, uh, which the the destruction in Syria is obvious, and we all know it. We've seen actually cities. Up, leveled. And then Iraq too, mm -hmm. uh, we saw quite a few Kurds and people coming from northern Iraq. They it had seems. no choice but to leave mm -hmm. or die. And then Afghanistan, the same thing. Afghanistan, uh, you don't see uh, cities being destroyed, but lives are being destroyed. We met uh, people who, uh, it, had they not left, uh, their daughters would be seized by either the ISIS. Taliban or ISIS. Uh, they, they would walk out their door and be assassinated because they appeared to have um, more money than other people. And it became untenable. We met uh, a farming uh, family of 23 people that sold their heritage, that sold their land to make, to move to Europe as best they could. And on the way they lost their grandmother and they were terribly frostbitten. So it was a you know family crisis. Just so you have violence of its many different iterations pushing people out, and then certainly you have the uh, many younger single men saying, "I can't make a living. I I have to go." 
and uh, many of those are coming okay. from uh, from Africa, although there are violent factors in Africa too, and from Pakistan. Uh, you know, it was shocking back in 19, uh, or sorry, 2016 to see Somalis in the refugee camp or Nigerians. That's no longer an aberration. These folks are coming out in droves. Boko Haram in, in, um, in Nigeria is a, a push to get uh, the, the uh, let's say the religious uh, yes. wars that are occurring in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, those, those folks that, that would go across the Sahara to, to get to Libya and then be enslaved in Libya and barely make it across the Mediterranean, it's unbelievable what they have to go through. And I think one reason we're seeing more Africans in, um, in Greece is that they, they can find ways to fly to Istanbul and then try to get across the Aegean Sea to Lesos. And although, you know, we've said that it's not so bad, but it is worse in, in the islands of Greece. It's worse than we saw in 2016, which was at the peak when over a million people came out of um, Greece into Europe. But now it's worse. I mean, uh, Camp Moria. Latifa, I, I want to hear a little bit from Latifa yeah. here. Latifa, how did you start doing this? I mean, you all have been on a family mission on this yeah. for a well, number of years. I'm, I'm, well, how did you jump in so thoroughly? We jumped in in 2015 when the crisis was in the beginning stage and uh, we were also very, very taken by um, the movie that is our you know, ministers, you know, the, the, the two who dare at that time it was called and they changed it to um, Righteous Among Us, The Sharps War. And um, we were, I was a big supporter and so was Colin of that, um, you know, uh, crisis where, when it happened during World War II. And then here we were, me being a daughter of refugee, you know, and what my parents went through and my whole family, my cousins and all of that, and we sponsored about 15 people at that time during the Russian war of Afghanistan. So both Colin and I knew firsthand what it is like to be a refugee and what they face and how we have to get involved. So during Thanksgiving dinner, Colin, um, after we saw Alan Kurdi also washed to the shore, he said, look, I am going, I'm committed. I want to be part of this mission where we could work closely with refugees and give the, reach out to them. And I said, of course, I'm going, you know, with you. And, and my daughter said, dad and mom, we want to be part of this uh, mission too. So as a family, we decided, and then I went to my congregation to social justice committee that I serve on. And I said, listen, you all know what's happening. And we are known for our good work at the congregation, you know, the Shelter Rock Congregation for you know, the, the Pentagon Papers and all of the, the wonderful things that they have done through our REACH program. So they said, well, what do you want us to do? I said, I would like the congregation to be committed to help through their large grant program, but my family and I are going to go on our own and this is what our mission is. And they were in total support of that. The congregation you know, got together through a petition that I did um, at that time, I was serving on the board of trustees of my congregation and the board unanimously agreed. They granted $200,000 to this crisis through the UUSC and through um, the group that was- um, the Syrian American Medical Association. Association, yes. So that was a success, but we still were not, Colin and I and my family, we started our trip at the end of 2015 and beginning of 2016. And since we had advertised it in our congregation in among other UUs, so we had about um, a doctor from my board and the congregation, and she was a pediatrician, uh, she still is, uh, Diane Lombardi, and she said, I wanna go with you. And then there's some other people wanting to go with us, but we could only fit so many people on the first, uh, um, you know, time of our trip. So Diane, Colin and I, I as a translator, Colin as a translator, he knows a little Persian and I know all the three languages, Persian, Pashto and Arabic, and I'm very familiar with the culture. 
and coming from 20 generations of Imam and, you know, and Islam, this is a, uh, also, it's not just a um, crusade, it's not a movement of just um, refugees of um, what it was in, in Hitler's time of the Jewish, now it's all Muslim. So I knew all of that stuff and I went with this clinic that Colin assigned us and found us uh, to be translator for doctors and nurses in um, Camp Moria, which is the largest camp in um, Lesbos, and till today it is. And on any given night, there will be 7,000 uh, refugees coming in and uh, being um, you know, screened and then sent back in two days or three days to put on the train and put on the boat to Europe. And that was a great time because we could be very helpful. We raised through my children effort, you know, one of my daughter went with us, but the other here in the United States raised about 26 to $30,000. And with that money that was raised from their friends, from the UUs that we got involved, we were very happy to give it hand to hand, face to face to those people who are fleeing Greece for Germany, for Sweden, for um, Norway and all of those countries they were gone. But unfortunately, well, it that was a great time and we helped a lot of families. Colin did build a lot of uh, tents on Camp Moria, the, the food tent, the um, tea tent, the clothing tent, and we worked in those. And it was a wonderful time. He collaborated with other people from, actually there were people from Israel, the doctors and, and lawyers who worked with us together so we could help this crisis and make a dent in it. And that was great. But March 20, um, 2016, the doors closed and people just all moved to Macedonia. And you are aware of that. And the media was on it, that it was just a, a violent situation because Europe said no. Um, and, and people were pushing and they broke that um, iron door and people were killed and hurt and children. So it was really bad. And then we made another trip during 2016 in August, again, to Thessaloniki, to Chios, to, and one of my cousin, I found out, my own cousin that was born after I left Afghanistan, and in now at the time she was like 38 years old, she was in a camp in Chios with her husband and two kids. Her husband was a doctor and they, um, they meaning the Afghan um, Taliban, who said, you're a devil, um, you know, because you're practicing um, modern medicine. And they were against him and they, they wanted to kill him. So the husband and the wife and the two children, the two sons, they escaped um, and they made it through a GNC because many people we have seen, and I've been in the funerals and so is Colin, where the the people have died in the GNC, but they made it, but then they were placed in Chios in one of the camp and I was shocked and surprised. And we cried together and we held each other and we brought them to our hotel. We worked with them. I did everything I could um, through the United Nations, to, but because she was not single woman, they couldn't process the papers. Once you are there, these poor refugees have been there for three to four years and their files have not been even looked at. They are short of staff, the UN I'm talking about. And there's no, they, they don't hear the voices and the Greek government is not that nice. The police are not very nice with the, the refugees, but the people of Greece are very nice. They're hospitable, they're welcoming. It's unfortunate, but the governments are always governments, just like our government, you know. So where are they in Athens? Are they, is there a place where everybody's were they all over the city? I mean, that's a big city. I'm that's trying a to good question, that. you know. Yeah, um, in the early uh, time, 2016, 17, there were uh, camps in industri abandoned industrial buildings, sweaty affairs where uh, there was, you know, it, it just, they would echo with sounds and uh, it, it was really tough. And there were actually scorpions food. and snakes. Were well, they, they, I mean, in Athens, they were in industrial buildings, and it, also in Thessaloniki, and um, you know, they were just just dumped there. Now, the UN High Commissioner is trying to get people into apartments. They give them a, a small stipend, uh, 
how long that's going to last, nobody knows. But in a way, the Afghan, this not the Afghan, but the refugees are dispersing into Athens. And that's one reason we're developing a, a craft cooperative a, a vocational training school uh, that is kind of centered in Athens where uh, people can come get training in Greek language, English and technical, refine their technical skills. So hopefully they, they can get a job in uh, Greece and, or they can make product and, and be compensated for making products. Uh, what's happening is that I think the refugees are starting to understand they may not move further and they have to make a life in Greece. Uh, this is a country with an unemployment rate of 30 to 40 percent. So it's yeah, that's what I was thinking. I have a really if good I friend in add, Athens and it's a mess also, over there. Yeah. Pardon me? Well, oh yeah, if I may add, you asked a question of where do they live. I met most of those people in elderly ladies in their 80s and 90s in the park, in Victoria Park. They are, were crying to me and said, Bibi John, that means dear um, child, you know, please, you know, I have lost my dignity, you know, because I have never slept in a park and here for months I'm in the park. Give me some kind of safety. Give me some place that I could go and sleep at night. I'm scared. I'm afraid. In, in, in some of the parks, Ammonia Park is totally drug infested in sexual yeah. trafficking. I mean, that's another horrific thing that with these young people who come, I saw a young man and they're even from Iran in Pakistan, countries that they have no war. And this young Iranian man told me, listen, you know, my mother, I'm trans. I changed my sex, you know, and you know the country because of the religious war, I would have been killed, you know, but I, until 16, I was a girl and I was not happy. And I, you know, went to a doctor in, in Turkey and I changed and then I couldn't go back to Iran and my life would be miserable. And now, you know, they are after me to kill me and I have no place to go. I have nowhere, you know, no food. We, we gave them some money and we tried to help them to introduce them to other centers. Like Colin said, we have a great connection now with UNICEF because of, again, uh, my daughter works for UNICEF and she was very um, instrumental in, uh, with a congregation to give another large grant of $100,000 to UNICEF. And UNICEF was wonderful to create five centers called the Blue Dot Centers all over Greece for women and children. And so, you know, that's where we build that relationship. So I refer this young man, I said, you could go to UNICEF, they will help you. But there are so many, I mean, I could tell you thousands of but stories. Let me give you a, a happy, happy ending. We got a, a note from this young man saying, I'm in France now. Mm -hmm. And I congratulated him the, on, the trans on man, his yeah. new country. And he, he sent a love note saying, thank you. You know, so people, they won't give up. They keep moving, moving, despite the tremendous risks of, of uh, you know, crossing now the, the Mediterranean uh, and the abuse that they get, even though the home country, let's say where they settle, may be better than where they came from, but it's not great. It's not great no. in France. It's not great in Germany right now. It's not great in England. There's a pushback, all a nationalist push, pushback all over Europe right now, like we are experiencing here too. So, you know, I listen to the story and people are still arriving in Greece, right? Yes. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, 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 yes. Um, yes. It's, it's amazing to me that, you know, these folks are fleeing Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, Afghanistan is not next to Greece. No. <laughs> no, I mean, no, to come from Afghanistan to Greece, you have to cross Iran, you have to cross Iraq, you have to yes. cross Syria or Turkey or Jordan and make it to the Mediterranean and then go across the water. I mean, you, yeah. you mentioned people having to cross the whole Sahara Desert yes. from, um, from, from Africa to get to Greece. Uh, and so the, they arrive in Greece um if they're lucky i imagine yeah. right? right they're fortunate okay. to survive that trip they arrive in greece and the european union is closed and the un system is hopelessly behind because it's so underfunded and the united states is not saying send us people no um because our administration is so xenophobic yep. um 
I mean, Canada can't take all these people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thankfully, no. their their doors are still open. But mm -hmm. you know, uh, so so I guess my question is, where do these folks who are getting to Greece hope to to go? I mean, you mentioned someone arriving in France. So I guess European countries are still taking refugees, even if very slowly. Where where if they could, you know, actually be processed by the United Nations in some sort of timely manner, where might they actually go? Well, um, right I, I now, wanna... Michael, to yeah. answer your question, right now, the Greek government has been given um, a certain amount of money, as you know, from the European countries. And the Greek government is absorbing these people and telling them, okay, we will process your paper and you become our... Um, uh, res residents, okay? So that's why I believe, and Colin um, all agrees with me, that those small nonprofits, or there's many other organizations besides our SBS, are very instrumental to take care of this population that stay in Greece, because there's not a lot of help provided. I mean, most of those people I met in Thessaloniki, in Athens, in Chios, they're living on the streets. So what the small groups of the nonprofit comes and they provide them with either language centers like we do or um, One Happy Family in Lesbos where they teach them skills, they give them food, but that still does not cover the entire yeah. 75,000 people. So there has to be plans and Colin wants to say something. Yeah, like I this. mean, uh, Michael, I, I guess the, the real issue is they're not folks are not going anywhere anymore and the eu states have decided to send them back which is uh, actually a violation of the rights of um, uh, asylum mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and right. there have been cases where uh, people have been sent back let's say to kabul and, and they're they're killed mm -hmm. um and that's again a ter uh, just a, a, a brutal case. violation mm -hmm. of the rights of uh refugees so you know, uh, Turkey got six something like six billion dollars to stop the flow and to essentially incarcerate people in in uh, refugee camps along the border with Syria. Mm -hmm. um, and and many, and now the EU is the you know it, in the early year Norway and Sweden uh, were uh, lifted up as the places who had let's say the countries that had made significant sacrifice on a per capita basis to accept refugees, they're pushing them back. Germany is doing the same. So uh, it's what's happening. People are understanding, the refugees are understanding that they're stuck, they're trapped, and they're beginning to despair. And they're, and then unfortunately, they're, when you despair, you have nothing to lose. And so the camps, let's say Camp Moria is getting incredibly violent. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, you're getting people that- They're beheading people. Who, people. Well, I mean, it, it's getting violent. It's very, not a safe place. We walked through that camp. We had no concerns other than the police. You know, we snuck around and got into the camps when the police had turned their backs. We were not worried about the refugees. Now I would be concerned. Uh, because there's no protection, there's no security, and the police won't get involved. If if a fight uh, starts and guys start knifing each other, there's no intervention, and it goes all the way. So it's very, very um, desperate. And I mean, we have still have friends. I have friends, refugee, young men, who call me in the middle of the night and say, Hala John, my dear aunt, please save me. The guy was just beheaded. A guy from Afghanistan had a fight with a guy from Syria and he was just beheaded. Please, what can I do? The police don't come. Nobody comes here. I just, I am in despair myself. Like what, how do we help these people? Be, um, women who are calling me, they're having babies walking alongside the road, you know, and, and there's no medicine for them. They look like ghosts. If you would have seen this young woman that was my friend and she got pregnant and she had this baby and there was nobody to take care of the baby. So I called one of our partners, Salam. I said, please give them some blankets, give them some food. They're dying, you know, from cold. And this woman is like, you know, her situ health situation was really bad. 
That's the kind of situation that's happening in Camp Moria, but no attention has been paid either by the Greek authority or by the United Nations or by any other um, you know, power to say, wait a minute, what is going on? Why should this happen to other humanity? Except mm -hmm. for small nonprofits like Salam and we work together and he's now the coordinator of children in um, Lesbos of, in Camp Moria, and he works with the children and women. You know, there are other One Happy Family, Swiss Cross, um, uh, the uh, Mosaic. Those are small nonprofits from Europe mostly have come with young people leadership in are there to help and to reach yeah. out to this massive crisis. But their money's running out. Yeah, and, they and, don't have money. I mean, it's, it, they can't keep doing it. And that's the problem. We're so we we had a choice as you know we have a charity so our choice was we could go there and distribute urgent humanitarian aid and we could do that in one Which day and did. all the assets are gone mm -hmm. or we could try to work with um, a population that feels that understands that they are going to be in greece for an undeterminate amount of time and they need to recover their lives and they need to have their kids go to school and they need to get uh, some kind of way to make a living mm -hmm. And so we I said, feel. we have limited resources. Let's try to build a cooperative where we can create, hopefully, a place where people can meet and, and uh, try to rebuild their lives. And we have and, that now. And what's know? neat about it, it's, it's got Syrians, Afghans, uh, Iranian, Iranians. Pakistan. It's got men and women in it. Uh, so it's yeah. kind of like building a new society together at the core, at the grassroots level. And that's our hope. Um, to you share know, humanity. Yeah. That's what we want to do. And we have now, we, um, you know, congratulate us because we are licensed by the Greek government and the SBS, uh, which is step by step cooperative, has started since November. And there are uh, 50 students right now that have been getting Greek in English language and also skills of carpentry and coding and sewing and hopefully eventually carpet making and all you know, in training for uh, to be waitress in waiters in the entertainment section in Greece. So that is what we are trying to support and to get other UUs involved and to bring you to the attention of our denomination in a big way that these people need you. These people need your help in person to person, human to human, we have to reach out. That is you know. what I believe in. You referenced the, the movie about the Sharps. And I, I was thinking about the part of the movie where they come back from Nazi Germany to the US to this suburban Wellesley congregation and try to rouse people's interest in it. And, and I kind of feel like those sleepy people as you talk, because you've seen something that I haven't and I can't even imagine. I, I mean, well, I, in this country, it's getting easier to imagine, but... Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. still, the, the level of cri humanitarian crisis that you're referencing and the lack of help in any direction. Yeah. Um, so, so your hope is in kind of, and I'm thinking of Adrian Marie Brown's, you know, local organizing for global um, problems. Yes. So, yeah. you're, so what congregations who hear you and say, we should care about this, what they could do is get involved supporting what you are doing or start yeah. something themselves or what would you what would you recommend that people who are um yeah, that's a, set that's on fire a about question this Meg. you know um one thing we did do a fundraiser on crowd rise and we were able to raise no, faith five. faith of fact, i'm sorry we were able to raise eleven thousand dollars which is among the the top tier so there's an interest uh, From the uh, among you use uh, to get involved um and to, to contribute, but our, our strategy, when, whenever we give us a talk and we show our little video in any congregation, we always get two or three people say, we wanna go. And we didn't, we couldn't give them a venue. We couldn't- uh, In we, the past. Yeah, in the past, we couldn't provide them with an answer to that. Now we can. You can come with us. You can go work at the cooperative. You can teach English for a couple of weeks. You can help, um, work on refining fashion development skills and and there's a lot you can do we we know and we are we have no doubt that you use want to get involved they just need a, 
a way to do it. A vehicle, and, yeah. Yeah, a vehicle, and I think we have that vehicle. So my hope also, and Latifah's hope is that when we go to congregations, if people say we want to get involved, we would say to them, well, please raise money, uh, raise money for your ticket. We'll help you get accommodations as inexpensive as we can. Raise a few, some more dollars that you can give either hand-to-hand, -hand, face to face to people. We'll give you guidelines or give to us so that to the core. When you have your congregations raising money for a particular cause, and we will develop kind of a, like a toolkit, uh, then it spreads, it goes out. I will, I will guarantee you, Meg, if you came with us, you would come back charged up and say, this can't, we can't continue this. Yeah. We are human beings. These are human beings. These are moms and dads and children that for no, apparent reason. no apparent, or let's say for no, uh, reason for them to suffer they are suffering and uh it's not right and we're seeing that at our border in the south now there's the brutality mm -hmm. we have to be an anecdote to to human brutality that's why we call our our charity shared humanity we share humanity with these folks and whatever we got we have we also want to share so uh, we have to get the word out. We have to give you use a way to be involved, to rub, rub shoulders with these folks, to know that they're not different. They're, there's no other here. And Latifa is instrumental in doing that because she knows both cultures and can bridge the gap between what uh, the apparent gap between the uh, two people or between cultures. Um, and also with the internet and the you know, people would come off the boats and they'd be holding their iPhone up and saying, we made it, we made it. And they were going back to Afghanistan. So uh, the younger people are tuned in to global uh, values, global sensitivities. And through the internet. Uh, through the internet. We, those are our hope to some degree. If, if someone wanted to, to go to help to teach English, to, to teach skills, whatever was, was needed, um, what would be a minimum amount of time that would be really requested. I mean, I imagine like, you know, someone going for four days to teach English is not really very useful. No, no. Uh, so I would imagine you, there would be some commitment of weeks or, or months uh, mm -hmm. requested. Do, is there a specific time I frame or request? Is, yeah, like a month or two months ahead of time, they have to let us know. Because right now we're in, um, actually, let me just mention that. Mm -hmm. We are, we have uh, Artemis Tchaikovsky, the grandson of the Sharp on our board, you know, on the board of Share Humanity. And he and I and Colin were planning another trip. This time Artemis wants to go with us. He wants to see it himself because we've been bringing stories and he's a, a great supporter. Just, but just to flag for people who don't know who he is, mm -hmm. would you please say who yeah. Artemis is? He is the grandson of um, the Sharps, Martha and Wastel Sharp. Uh, Wastel Sharp was our um, minister, um, and uh, Wellesley, you know, and they were the two amazing heroes of our religion that went to um, Czechoslovakia, Portugal, France during World War II and saved thousands of uh, Jewish refugees from the atrocity of Hitler. So, of course, the movie that was made in 2016 by Artemis. Uh, Tchaikovsky and Ken Burns, um, in, which was shown in the White House, uh, screened in the White House, is that movie the story of their journey and what a difference they made in the lives of the Jewish refugees. So he is now continuing that with us, um, with Sheer Humanity, and wants to give, he's already assigned because we got his Sharps Award in 2017. And now in 2018, uh, no, 2019, he wants to award Angela uh, or Angela Merkel um, with the Sharps Award. And the award has already been accepted by the German government. He's been in contact. So we're going to go to Greece on a trip to visit the step-by-step -step workshop and, um, and the cooperative, I'm sorry. And then once they see that and... Um, then we're going to take the story to Germany because I have a lot of uh, Colin and I that and my daughters have worked with families, refugees 
who in 2016 made it to Germany. So then we're gonna go visit those families that they are now happy, they have a home, you know, rental place, whatever that Germany has given. And Angela Merkel has been very, very instrumental and to, to let about a million and more refugees to her country. Although she is getting a lot of backlash for that from other countries, but we award her with the sharp award through sheer humanity that this woman has done phenomenal job for humanity. And the same with uh, Justin uh, Trudeau in, in Canada, because we, we are grateful to such leaders in the world that could save humanity in that way. Um, so if, if you want, let's say there are people from my congregation, they want to come with us and they've already told me. So through my connection with our partners, I arrange for um, their hotel, for where they stay, how long do they stay. There are special forms that Colin and I have developed and we could send these forms to our UU friends and um, acquaintance that can fill out how long do you intend to go for um, and how much money should you raise. And the plane ticket has to do with them, but the accommodations we will cover, but they have to uh, contribute some money to the SBS cooperative. So our hope is that we could continue because money is very important for any type of nonprofit to continue its good work. And right now we have budgeted only for six months, but we would love to continue with this cooperative, which is really working very well for the refugees, at least for a year or two. Yeah, I would, I would like us to bring in high skills when necessary. And that's why, uh, you know, an evaluation a couple months ahead of time or a month ahead of time, if we have women working, let's say, for instance, or uh, uh, let's say a group working on coding, we would want to bring in somebody who has, uh, who could explain how to, to develop the various codes. Um, if we have somebody doing uh, clothing and we have the designer. sewing machines, we might want to bring in a designer. They're all over New York, you know, um, a designer to come in for a week or two. These are high skilled people that will just lift up the skill level of uh, the refugees that have been in, you know, basically in their homes for a couple of years now. They and been, I would say without the skills, they yeah. love to see Americans. Yeah. I'm telling you, their heart and soul, that smile that you have on your face, that you walk into the center and you shake their hand or you give them a hug. That is like a million dollar you've given them because these people really need the love and the connection in, that they have lost, that they have suffered through. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be, I mean, it's a wonderful idea to have high skills and all that, but if you don't have any skills and you yeah. have the heart and the soul to help humanity and to just smile at them and be there and acknowledge that you are there with them as a human. That works. Yeah, we very definitely well. would want uh, a visitor to also go to Moria to see yeah. what it looks like on the front lines of the crisis. Uh, you cannot, you cannot go there and not be moved uh, because it's tough and it's, it's hard. It's hard to see, and then you leave these people behind. A lot of them give the, give you their stories of tragedy and loss, and then you carry that burden. And what you do with that burden is really, uh, maybe that's what informs us when we come no, back. No, bring it back and share, share with your neighbors, bring... share with your friends, yeah. share with your congregations. That's how we create a movement. Movement is created by all of us working yeah. together to one goal. Right now, I mean, Meg, you put it beautifully. You know, Martha in Waste of Wind, and then they came back to their uh, afflu affluent society in sleepy you know, i mean i have that struggle every day with a lot of my own wonderful unitarian who really follows the principles but they say what are you talking about you know and i have to talk again and again and again to make them aware to say come and i have been successful but i want to do more it's not enough we all have to do it it is our moral responsibility and we all have to have the moral courage to tackle this issue and many other issues that right now we're dealing with in this country. Well, since this is a, a UU show, I'm curious how you sustain your faith and how you sustain um, spiritual practice in all of this, because 
even hearing your description, it sounds like it could be very overwhelming and cause you to just stop and crawl into bed and pull up the covers. So how, what sustains you? You know, wait, I've always asked um, or said that we need a minister to be with us because that, you know, when we first went, uh, Latifah couldn't sleep. I mean, it was- I can sleep. She was still. up all night Four trips, long. Never you know, sleep. And, yeah. I write and write and write their yeah. stories and I put it on Facebook or I send it to friends, or I Cause I want to share, I can't sleep. And I, it's not that because it's so much in me. It, it, it's like, in a way it's very uplifting, you know, but because I can give them hugs, I can talk to them, I could laugh with them. I can give them continue their hope. But on the other hand, yes, it is. And because of that, I attend yoga, I do meditation and I can't sleep. I still, when I'm home, when I get that call from Greece because the timing difference at night, you know, I just, it's my mind is racing and I'm thinking how I want to find solutions. How could I do this? How could I do this? And we have been blessed and lucky that we have very good, wonderful people on our Share Humanity Board, which most of them are, almost all of them, except for one person, are Unitarian Universalists. Yeah. So that is a great thing that collaboratively, they believe in this and they give us support, financial support mainly. And we take, because that is so important, to support the causes in, in the pains, in the hearts of those people who have been desperately in despair. Yeah, yeah. You know. Colin, you were starting to say about, you wish that a minister would be there. Can yeah. you, that yeah. you know, it would be nice to have, right now we're at the point where we, we have a, a, a group, we have our partners developed. And one thing I wanna make a note of, this cooperative was designed by refugees. It's managed by refugees. It, it and it's for the benefit of refugees. It's the one only one of its kind in Greece that is refugee centered. It's the best example of a grassroots development by multiple communities. And my my deepest hope is that it will be so successful that it will be a an example for the world that what can be done when these these people get together and the given the right tools and the right support how they can excel um you know with but, to but, but but with regard to you no know, now that we have this we can start to package if you will groups to come for the experience of working you know it's it's not just to view but it's to work with refugees and also to see the trauma that occurs and we would have to be sensitive to the needs of people to like how do you say to process this what they're seeing because you may you never have seen it before and you may never have felt so helpless before and you may never have felt so emotionally engaged before uh, because you cannot be a bystander when this happens so we yeah i would like to have somebody guide us and and when we come back to our our accommodations at night just to de decom decompress and to process what we've seen because you'll go back um not traumatized but in energized that yes you made a difference you and a difference a difference could have been in just helping one family or one child get into school or or provide medical assistance or uh, like Latifa said, a, a smile or uh, a, hug. Know, a hug. Right now, we, we have to be anecdotes to the perception that America doesn't care. And that all, the last thing, Meg, I want to say is that what bothered us, or what particularly bothered me, is that you use are not identified as a faith community working with refugee communities, at least in Europe. I think we are on the border of Arizona and California. USC, yeah. We are. But it bothered me that there were other um, faith groups highly identified in doing excellent work and being noted for that excellent work. And we were not. We have basically, uh, I don't want to be, uh, we have delegated that work to, yes. to the UUSC and they do wonderful work. But I think we should be identified as Unitarian Universalists 
and nomination. Th those yeah. yellow shirted people that or care about On love, the side of love. Who are these folks? Are. You know, these loving people. I want us to be identified that way. Every time we go, yeah. we wear our t-shirts. Yeah. But one thing I was going to say with regards to the minister, you know, I've talked to the Reverend um, uh, Fenimore, Natalie Fenimore, our, about creating a program because she's on the Star King uh, board um, to see if we could send our ministerial interns for a week or two to come with us to see what's happening and to really get trained and start a program that way. If we can't do it, you know, as a whole denomination, like what Colin said, to be recognized as you use are the loving people, at least our ministers for internship could go there and, and work in that field. In that way, we could create that movement that you use, be identified as the loving people for humanity in the other side, in Greece, in the Balkans, in France, in uh, uh, wherever the, Italy. I mean, all of these countries have a lot of refugees, but the first uh, receiving point is the Aegean, through the Aegean Sea in Lesbos, Greece. That's how they get there. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here uh, and for carrying these stories and, and bringing them back. Thank and you. Um, it's making me think of the work after Hurricane Katrina when right. Unitarian Universalists and the Center for Ethics and Social Justice down there does help people to process, of course, the, the immediate trauma that was there immediately after has diminished, yeah. but the, the underlying causes haven't gone anywhere. Um, but yeah, that, that opportunity, and of course, that's what the College of Social Justice is doing through the USC, but sure. thank you so much for your witness and your work and for, for being the change we wanna see. Thank you. Well, thank for you for inviting Thanks. us yeah. and for having us and hopefully you'll have us again after our- Absolutely, yeah. doesn't trip, sound like this is, is going, going away. At the end yeah. of February and March. And if anybody wants to come with us, please just call my phone number or email me and I will be happy to arrange for you to come with us and to see it firsthand. In and February or March, is that what you just said? Yeah, the end of February, okay. beginning of March. Okay, February. you all heard it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank, you thank you so you. much. Thank you, Michael. Next thank time. you, Jessica, uh, bye for bye. arranging this. Thank bye. you so much. and so nice to see you. And Happy New Year to everyone in the country and to all our UUs. Thank <laughs> you. Indeed. Bye-bye.